All right, good stuff. Well, uh, tonight we're going to continue uh, looking at our series on a little bit of what the Bible says about identity. And last week we finished up the first phase of that series, and in the first phase we were looking at the question, who am I? Tonight we're going to begin the second phase of this series in which we're looking at the question, who is God? And tonight we're going to begin looking at who God is by looking at the fact that God is Trinity. God is one divine nature, three distinct persons. He is a triunity. He is three in one. Now, the Trinity is not something that is easy to fully wrap our minds around. And we're going to go deep tonight. This will be a different kind of sermon than we are normally used to. Most preachers probably have enough sense not to attempt what I'm going to attempt tonight. Uh, Honestly, I'm not sure this is going to work. This is either going to be really awesome or am I, I'm going to crash and burn tonight, I don't know. But either way, buckle your seatbelt because here we go. In our short time tonight, we are just going to barely scratch the surface of what the Bible says about the Trinity. We're going to be looking at a ton of passages tonight because the doctrine of the Trinity is not something just found in one verse in the Bible. There is evidence for the Trinity sprinkled throughout the entire Bible. And so since we're going to be looking at an unusually large amount of scriptures tonight, I recommend that you follow along on the screens or that you use the handout that's in your folder. In everybody's folders I've got handouts that have all of the scriptures on there. So the doctrine of the Trinity is this. First of all, the Bible teaches that there is only one God. Secondly, that this one God is three persons. The Father, the Son who became Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And all three persons of the Trinity are fully God. And so what this means is that God is one and three at the same time. That there is a sense in which God is singular, and there is a sense in which He is plural, at the same time but in different ways. Now some people have argued, well Brian, the word Trinity is not even in the Bible. And they're correct. But the concept is, and if I do my job tonight, that's what I want to prove tonight. What I want to do is look at why we believe from the Bible that God is Trinity. And what we see when we look at the Bible is the Bible is absolutely clear that there is only one God. And yet, the Bible calls three different persons God. This is quite a riddle in the Bible. I mean, how do you you reconcile that? that the Bible says there's only one God, and yet the Bible calls three different persons God. Well, this is a pretty tough riddle that Christianity already solved long ago by recognizing that God is Trinity. So let's focus on the first truth for a few moments. The first truth that we're going to look at is that the Bible is absolutely clear that there is only one God. Look with me in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 21. God says... There is no other God besides me. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 8, verse 4. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and there is no other God but how many? One. Now, although the Bible constantly teaches that there is only one God, there were times in the Bible when God spoke about himself in the plural. Let me give you some examples. Genesis 126. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Genesis 3.22, then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. Genesis 11.7, come let us go down there and confuse their language. Well, if there's only one God, then why does God so often refer to himself in the plural? There are many different theories on what exactly is going on here. Most of early Christianity believed that this was a hint of the Trinity. That the reason God was speaking of himself in the plural was that this was a conversation amongst the three persons of the Trinity. And I think I probably lean towards that interpretation as well. Now let me give you one example that's particularly interesting. This is Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8. Isaiah says, Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? In this one verse, 
God refers to himself with the singular I and the plural us. What's going on here? Well, I think this again is evidence of the Trinity. God speaks of himself in the singular and plural because there is a sense in which God is singular and there is another sense in which he is plural. One of the greatest examples of this plurality of God in the Old Testament is Psalm 110 verse 1. Did you know that Psalm 110 verse 1 is the most quoted Old Testament verse in the New Testament? Jesus and his disciples loved to use this verse to argue against people in Israel who thought that it was impossible that Jesus could be God. The reason they loved this verse so much is because this verse was a riddle in the Old Testament and the only way to solve this riddle is with the doctrine of the Trinity. Let's look together at Psalm 110 verse one. David, King David writes this. David says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. There were some seriously difficult riddles in this passage. The first riddle was this. Who is the second Lord above David? Remember, when King David wrote this, this was back in the days when kings were really kings. You know, today kings don't really have much power at all. But back in these days, the king was the king. The only being above a king was God. Well, if the only being above King David was God, then who is the second Lord that David's talking about? Who are these two lords that are above King David? Well, because of the Trinity, we now know how to solve this riddle. The first Lord in this verse is God the Father. The second Lord in this verse is God the Son who became Jesus Christ. Now in English, the same word is used twice, Lord, Lord. But in Hebrew, this is even clearer because in Hebrew, these are actually two different words. The first word is Yahweh, which is God's personal name. The second Lord is actually the word Adonai, which is the Hebrew word for Lord or Master. And so in Hebrew, this verse says that Yahweh said to Adonai, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The second riddle in this verse is how could David's descendant also be his Lord? Jewish people knew that this verse was a prophecy about a Messiah who would one day come. And every Jewish person knew that the Messiah was going to be a human descendant of King David. So here's the riddle. How can a distant descendant of King David somehow also be his Lord? Well, now because of the doctrine of the Trinity, we know how to solve this riddle. God the Son has eternally been Lord. But God the Son became a human descendant of King David when he was incarnated in the womb of Mary as the God-man Jesus Christ. So, the Bible says there is only one God. But then, there are three persons in the Bible called God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that God the Father is God. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all. So this verse says that God the Father is God. Now I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on, on this part of it because pretty much everyone's in agreement that God the Father is God. What I'm gonna spend most of my time on tonight is the fact that God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are also God. The Bible says that God the Son, who became Jesus Christ, is God. Sometimes people will say, well, Brian, the Bible never explicitly calls Jesus God. Sure it does. That is absolutely incorrect. Anybody who says that to you is somebody who's never really read their Bible very closely. Let me show you some passages that explicitly call Jesus God. Look with me at Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. This is a prophecy about the Messiah. A lot of times we see this at Christmas time. Maybe you've gotten a Christmas card that had this passage in it. But in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, 
mighty what? God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So here's one of those riddles in the Old Testament. This is a prophecy that there would one day be a human child who would be born, but somehow this human child would also be called Almighty God. Well, how can that be? Who is this passage talking about? Well, now we know. Who is this verse talking about? Jesus, right? And the doctrine of the Trinity helps us understand that. That Almighty God, God the Son, became a human being when he was incarnated as the God man, Jesus Christ. Look with me at John chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, that's another title for Jesus, and the, world, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This passage talks about the Word, which means Jesus, and this passage says that Jesus was God and that he was with God. So which is it? Was Jesus God or was Jesus with God? Well, both. Because of the doctrine of the Trinity, we know how to understand this now. That Jesus was God because he was the same essence as God the Father, but he was with God because he is the Son who is the second person of the Trinity and not the Father who is the first person of the Trinity. The next verse we'll look at that explicitly calls Jesus God is the story of doubting Thomas. And as we read this, notice what Thomas calls Jesus, okay? Uh, John chapter 20, starting in verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, said to Jesus, my Lord and my what? God. Thomas called Jesus God. Look with me at Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. For in him, in Jesus, all, well, excuse me, I got ahead of myself. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So let me ask you, according to this verse, how much of God was in Jesus? All of it, right? This is another way of saying that Jesus was 100% God. Look with me at Romans chapter 9, verse 5. It says, of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came. Now look at this description of Jesus Christ, who is over all. Why is Jesus Christ over all? Because he's God. The eternally blessed what? God, amen. Look with me at Titus chapter 2, verse 13. It says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great who? God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, this next one is a little complicated, but this is one of my favorites. I love this one. This passage is a quote of something God the Father said to his Son. Look with me in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8. But to the Son, he says, God says to his Son, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. So notice here, God is speaking to his son, and what does God call his son? God. How can this be? Well, this is a riddle that we now know how to solve through the doctrine of the Trinity. God the Father is speaking to his son, God the Son, who became Jesus Christ. Now, when we read the New Testament, if we read it closely, we also see that Jesus himself claimed to be God. Sometimes people say, well, Jesus never said that he was God. Sure he did. Anybody who tells you that has never read the Bible very closely. Let me give you some examples. Jesus claimed to be one with the Father. Look with me at John chapter 10, verse 30. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. In this passage, Jesus claimed to be one with God the Father, which is another way of claiming to be equal with God the Father. Why would Jesus claim to be equal with God the Father? Because Jesus is God. Jesus called himself the Son of God, and the Son of God is a claim to divinity. When Jesus was calling himself the Son of God, he wasn't claiming to be less than God, he was claiming to be equal with God. In fact, look with me at John chapter 5, verse 16. <clears throat> For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, 
my father has been working until now, and I've been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself what? Equal with God. The Jews fully recognized that claiming to be the son of God was claiming to be equal with God. That's why they wanted to kill Jesus for saying that. Look with me in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. It says, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Why did Jesus not consider it robbery to be equal with God? Because he was God, right? I think that's what it means here when it says that he was in the form of God. That's another way of saying that he is God. Now, not only did Jesus claim to be God with his own words, but he proved that he was God with his actions. There was a lot of things that Jesus did that only God is supposed to do. For example, the Bible says that Jesus created the universe and holds it together. Look with me in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. It says he, that's Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. What this means is when you look at Jesus, you can see God. Why can you see God when you look at Jesus? Because he is God. You guys are, you guys are tracking. I love it. And then it says that Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. This is speaking about Jesus' authority over everything. Why does Jesus have authority over everything? Because Jesus is God, right? Verse 16, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him. How was it that Jesus was able to create all things? Because he's God. But not only were all things created through him, it says that all things were created for him. Why did Jesus deserve to have all things created for him? Because he was God. You guys are with me. I love it. Uh, the other thing that Jesus did that was a God sort of thing to do was that Jesus forgave sins. Look with me in Mark chapter 2, verse 5. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Good question. They're right. Only God can forgive sins. Why did Jesus forgive sins? Because Jesus is God. All right. Another sort of God thing that Jesus is going to do is that one day Jesus will judge the earth. Look with me at Matthew 25, verse 31. Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, who is the Son of Man? Jesus. When Jesus comes in his glory, all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Jesus will be the one who judges the earth. Did you know that? Now, why will Jesus be the one who judges the earth? Because Jesus is God. Another sort of God thing that Jesus did is Jesus let people worship him. Look with me at uh, Mark chapter 14. This is one of the stories of Jesus calming the sea. And in verse 32 it says, And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. And the interesting thing is Jesus didn't stop them. How different than the angels. There are sometimes in the Bible where people mistakenly start worshiping an angel, and whenever that happened, the angel stopped them. And they said, whoa, 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 don't worship us. Don't worship us. Worship God. He's the only person that should be worshiped. But Jesus never stopped anybody from worshiping him. Why? Because he's God. He deserves to be worshiped. Not only does the Bible show us that God the Father is God, and God the Son is God, but the Bible also shows us that God the Holy Spirit is God. Which passages in the Bible show us that the Holy Spirit is God? Well, there are some passages in the Bible in which the name of the Holy Spirit is used on an equal level with the name of God the Father and God the Son. 
Probably the most famous is Matthew 28. Look with me at Matthew 28. This is the Great Commission, verse 19. Jesus said to his disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The fact that the Holy Spirit is included as a name equally worthy to baptize people into is a clue that he is equally God. How strange would this Great Commission be if it said, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of Pastor Brian. Wouldn't that be strange? I mean, which one of these three three things does not belong, right? My name does not deserve to be equally in that sentence. The Holy Spirit's name does. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is God. There are also times in the Bible where the Holy Spirit, the name of the Holy Spirit, is used interchangeably with God. Let me give you an example. Acts chapter 5. This is the story of when Ananias and Sapphira lied about how much money they'd given to the church. And so in Acts chapter 5, verse 3, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Wait a minute. In verse 3, Peter said that Ananias had lied to the Holy Spirit. In verse 4, Peter says that Ananias lied to God. So which is it? Did Ananias lie to the Holy Spirit, or did Ananias lie to God? Yes, both, right? Uh, Because the Holy Spirit is God. The other thing when we look at the Bible is we see that the Holy Spirit is often described as having attributes that only God has. For example, omnipresence. Look with me at Psalm 139, verse 7. Here David says, Where can I go from your spirit? That's the Holy Spirit. Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. This passage says that the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. He is everywhere. What do we call the being who is omnipresent and everywhere. God, the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is also described in the Bible as having omniscience of knowing everything. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. It says, for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the who? The spirit of God. What this verse is saying, is that the Holy Spirit knows everything that God knows. Well, God knows everything. Therefore, the Holy Spirit knows everything. Why does the Holy Spirit know everything? Because he is God. Another sort of God thing that the Holy Spirit does is the Holy Spirit can give a new spiritual life. Look with me at John chapter 3, verse 5. Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit... That's the Holy Spirit. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, when we look at the Bible, only God can give new spiritual life. Only God can make someone born again. Well, this passage says that the Holy Spirit is able to give new spiritual life, and the Holy Spirit is able to make someone born again. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is God. Okay. I don't know if I'm wearing you guys out. I'm going to kind of put that part of the sermon to a close there. Um, We could go on like this for days, right? But this brief survey has shown us that there is a sense in which God is one, but there is another sense in which God is three. One divine essence, three divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And as Christians, we have to be very careful to hold on to both truths, that God is one and that God is three. If we let go of either side, we're going to end up in heresy. If we let go of either one of those truths, we're going to end up with an unbiblical and untrue understanding of who God is. For example, there have been some who have made the error of focusing so much on the fact that God is one 
that they have rejected the biblical teaching that God is three. This is an ancient error that is still prevalent today. Now, the vast majority of Pentecostals are orthodox when it comes to the Trinity. But there is a certain group of Pentecostals called Apostolic Pentecostals who are not orthodox when it comes to the Trinity. This group, Apostolic Pentecostals, are often called Oneness Pentecostals because of their emphasis on the oneness of God and their rejection of the threeness of God. These Apostolic Pentecostals are often sometimes called Jesus only Pentecostals because when they baptize people, they only baptize people in the name of Jesus instead of the way that Jesus commanded us to baptize people in Matthew 28, which was in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. One of the most common ways that people reject the threeness of God is something called modalism. Modalism. Now remember, the Bible teaches Trinity. The Trinity is that God is one God who is three persons at the same time. But modalism teaches not that God is three persons at the same time, but that he is one person who can take on three different forms at different times that he can transform from one manifestation of God into another. For example, that at one moment he could manifest himself as God the Father, but in the next moment transform himself to manifest as God the Son. Um, so what they believe is there's one person of God who can take on three different forms that is very different than what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches there is one God who is three persons. Now, whenever I meet a modalist, and it does happen every now and then, um, I love to show them a passage that annihilates their position. And here it is, Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. This is the baptism of Jesus. And in this story, we see all three persons of God at the same time. It says, when he had been baptized, when Jesus had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God, that's the Holy Spirit, descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Here we see all three persons of the Trinity present at the same exact time. God the Son, Jesus Christ, is in the water getting baptized. The Holy Spirit comes down like a dove and God the Father speaks from heaven. So this does not fit in the modalist view. According to them, this shouldn't be able to to happen, right? Because you see all three persons of the Trinity at the same time. Now, there's an opposite error that people make, and that is to let go of the part that God is one and focus only on the part that, um, no, excuse me, let's hear. To, the opposite error is to focus so much on the fact that God is three, there we go, that we throw out the part that he is one. This is another ancient error that is still prevalent today. For example, Jehovah's Witnesses. So Jehovah's Witnesses reject the biblical teaching of the Trinity. They do not believe that God is three persons, and they do not believe that Jesus is fully God. Instead, they believe that Jesus is a separate, smaller, lowercase g God, which by the way makes them polytheists. And the Holy Spirit, they don't believe is a person at all, they believe he's an impersonal force like gravity or electromagnetism or something like that. Another group are the Mormons, the Church of Latter-day Saints. They also reject the doctrine of the Trinity. They don't believe that Jesus is fully God. They believe he's something less than fully God. But for us true Christians, we have got to hold on to both truths and not let go of either side, that God is one and three. One divine nature, three divine persons. All right. Now it's easy to make the error of thinking that the Trinity is too abstract or too esoteric or too complicated to make any difference in our personal daily lives. But I believe that the doctrine of the Trinity does make a difference in our personal lives. Let me give you three ways. How should it affect our daily lives that God is Trinity? First of all, the fact that God is Trinity gives us yet another reason to worship him. The fact that God is Trinity is one of the things that makes God unique. It's one of the things that makes God special. It's one of the things that makes God one of a kind. People are often amazed by things that are one of a kind. For example, did you know there's a place in the United States called Four Corners? 
Has anybody ever been to Four Corners before? Okay, a lot of people. So what Four Corners is, is it's a corner where four states come together. Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. And this spot is one of a kind. It's the only place in America where you can be in four states at the same exact moment. So if you've ever gone, what people like to do is you put one hand in one state, another hand in another state, another foot in another state, and another foot in another state, and boom, you're in four states at once, right? So this is, it's special, it's unique, it's one of a kind, and it amazes people. Think about Tom Brady. Tom Brady is the only football player to ever have won seven Super Bowls. That makes him special. That makes him unique. That makes him one of a kind, and people are amazed by it. Pastor Phil is the only person I know who has ever tried to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich out of a phone book. Amen. Now, I don't know if you've heard this story, but Pastor Phil has a little bit of a problem in that he walks in his sleep, all right? And um, one night, the family woke up from a, a wonderful night of sleep, and they went out into their kitchen, and on the counter, there was a phone book that had peanut butter and jelly in it and teeth marks on the outside. <laughs> so we've all known for a long time that Pastor Phil is definitely one of a kind, right? And people are amazed. They're amazed by him. Well, you know what? God is one of a kind. There is nothing like him. There is no one like him. And that should amaze us. And that should make us want to worship him. Now, the fact that God is one of a kind means that all analogies fall short. What do I mean by that? It's not easy to understand the Trinity, and it's not easy to explain it, all right? Believe me, I'm trying tonight, okay? I don't know if I'm succeeding or not. But my point is that um, it's hard to explain. And so sometimes, while we're trying to explain the Trinity to someone, we're tempted to use a comparison and say, well, the Trinity is like blank. We often do this with kids. When our kids say, uh, you know, I've had my girls ask this, Daddy, is Jesus God or is he the Son of God? And so in that moment, we're tempted to use a comparison to try to make it easy to understand. Sometimes people say, uh, well, you know, honey, um, the Trinity is kind of like a three-leaf clover. There's three leaves, but it's the same clover. But that is incorrect. The Trinity is not like a three-leaf clover. Because on a three-leaf clover, each leaf is only 33% of the clover. But in the Trinity, each person of the Trinity is 100% God. Sometimes people say, well, honey, it's kind of like an egg. In an egg, you have a shell, and you've got a white, and you've got a yolk, but it's all one egg. But that is incorrect. The Trinity is not like an egg. Because in an egg, the shell is only 1% of the egg, and the white is 66% of the egg, and the yolk is 32% of the egg. I looked it up on Google earlier. <laughs> uh, you were wondering how I do that, right? Well, that's very different than the Trinity in which each person of the Trinity is 100% God. Sometimes people say, well, honey, it's kind of like water. Water can be a solid ice, water can be liquid, or water can be vapor. But the Trinity is not like that, okay? Because that's talking about one substance in three different forms. That is not what God is. God is one God in three persons. Sometimes people say, well, honey, it's kind of like me. I can be a father, a son, and a brother all at the same time. But that is incorrect. The Trinity is not like that. That's one person with three roles that is not the same as one God in three persons. Here's the hard truth. The second you say the words, the Trinity is like blank, then congratulations, you just accidentally fell into heresy. <laughs> you didn't mean to do it, but that's what happened. Because there's nothing else like the Trinity. There is nothing else in all of existence that is one and three in the same way that God is one and three. The fact that God is Trinity is one of the reasons that it, one of, the fact that God is Trinity is what it means that God is holy, that he's different, that he's in a class of his own, that he's special, that he is unique. And God deserves to be worshiped for being unique like that. A second application of the doctrine of the Trinity for our daily lives is the fact that God is Trinity helps us understand why relationships are so important to God. When you read the Bible, it's amazing how much of the Bible is about relationships. 
I mean, the Bible is packed full of instructions about how to do our relationships, of the kind of relationships that God wants us to have with our spouse and with our kids and with our parents, of the kind of relationships that God wants us to have with our boss and our employees, of the kind of relationships that God wants us to have with the government officials who rule over us, of the kinds of relationships that God wants us to have with our brothers and sisters in Christ, even the kinds of relationships that God wants us to have with our enemies. Remember, love your enemy, right? Well, why does God care so much about relationships? Why does he value relationships so much? Perhaps, It's because he has eternally existed as a relationship of three persons. I think the more we understand the Trinity, the more it makes sense why God cares so much about relationships. And the third and final application tonight is the fact that God is Trinity helps us appreciate what Jesus went through for us on the cross. Remember when Jesus was on the cross, in that agonizing moment when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did Jesus cry that out? Why did he say that? Why did God, his father, reject and and forsake Jesus in that dreadful moment? Well, it was because in that moment, the terrible sins of humanity were placed on Jesus' back. And in some way that we don't completely understand, God the Father, who is so pure that he cannot even look upon sin, had to turn his back on his own son. It seems that in some way I don't fully understand and I can't completely explain that the pure, unbroken fellowship of the Trinity was in some sense interrupted in that moment. And for the first time in the history of eternity, God the Son, Jesus Christ, knew what it was like to experience the awful feeling of being truly alone. Why did Jesus go through something like that? Why did he subject himself to something so painful? We're the ones who sinned. We're the ones who deserve to be separated from God. But because Jesus loves us so much, he took the separation from God for us so we didn't have to be separated from God. Jesus was forsaken by his Father so we don't have to be forsaken by the Father. Jesus was left alone so that we will never have to be alone again. And I've often wondered, this must have been one of the worst parts of the cross. I mean, the physical punishment Jesus took was bad enough, but I don't think that even compares to the relational pain Jesus went through of being forsaken by his Father because of our sin. Remember, Jesus took the physical lashing and didn't even cry out. But when he did cry out, was in that agonizing moment when Jesus became sin for us. Look with me at one last verse tonight. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. This verse says, For he, that's God the Father, made him who knew no sin, that's God the Son who became Jesus Christ, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is one of the deepest verses in the entire Bible. This verse tells us that not only did Jesus take our sins on his back, but this verse tells us that even something further happened than that. That in some way, Jesus became sin for us. What does that even mean? I'm not entirely sure. But I think that what it means is that in that dreadful moment, Jesus, the sinless one, became sin in the eyes of his heavenly father. That when God looked at Jesus in that moment, he no longer saw the sinless son of God. Instead, he saw our own sin. That when God the father looked at Jesus in that moment, he saw the rapist, the murderer, the pedophile, the terrorist, the adulterer, the wife beater. And because of that, God the father had to turn away from his own son. Why did Jesus go through all this? Jesus did all of that so that now when God looks at us, if we're believers, he doesn't see a sinner anymore. Instead, he sees Jesus. I think that's part of what it means to be clothed in Jesus' righteousness. I think it means to be wrapped up in it. It means to be hidden in it. It means to be covered by it. Jesus became sin in his Father's eyes so that we could become righteous in the Father's eyes. 
And now when God looks at us believers, he no longer sees the sinner. Instead, he sees Jesus, the one who never sinned. Now because of what Jesus did on the cross, when God the Father looks at us, he sees the one who fed the hungry and healed the sick. Now because of the cross, when God looks at us, he sees the one who performed miracles and who preached the kingdom of God. Now when God looks at us, he sees the one who lifted up the downtrodden and raised the dead back to life. It's the doctrine of the Trinity that helps us understand the horrific price Jesus paid for us because he just loves us that much. And my prayer is that this message tonight has helped us understand a little more about who God is and what God has done for us. Because God is Trinity. Let me pray. Our Father in heaven, God, we thank you that you are Trinity. Lord, we don't fully understand what that means, but your Bible teaches it, and so we believe it. And God, we worship you for it. You are so special, you are so unique, you are so one of a kind, you are so holy, you are so different, you are in a class of your own. There is nothing like you. There is not even anything that can be compared to you. You stand by yourself. And God, I pray that we would be amazed by that and never lose sight of that. God, I pray, Lord, that we would keep careful theological hold of both aspects of the Trinity. And Lord, I pray that this would not just be some academic or scholastic exercise, but Lord, that this would affect how we worship, that it would affect how we live, that it would affect how we think about you. And God, please, Lord, help us to live out the truths that we have learned about you tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.